Hi. Uh, welcome to our talk. My name is Desh Shukla. I am part of Cisco IT, a cloud design engineer working on OpenStack. And uh, my name is Steve Pierce. I'm the OpenStack solutions architect for Cisco IT. So in today's talk, we want to talk about uh, what the enterprise application trends are that we see uh, in our enterprise, what has been our OpenStack implementation journey, what are the lessons learned as we uh, went through this journey, and talk about our next steps and our future plans. And if we have time, we'll talk about some Q&A. So today's application architecture, these are some of the common patterns that we see. The applications are elastic. They can dynamically allocate resources. They can shrink down depending upon their requirements. They are flexible. They are built on different operating systems. They can run on different platforms. And they are need to be deployed faster because they have the promise of having time to market in a shorter time. These applications also have resiliency characteristics, so they have uh, designed to deal with infrastructure failure. For such an application architecture and to help promote cloud adoption within our enterprise, we came up with a framework to identify applications which are either cloud tolerant or all the way up to cloud native. The basic difference between these three uh, paradigms are for uh, legacy applications like uh, ERP, which have state maintained within them. They have applications which are monolithically built. Uh, they do not have resiliency in their architecture and rely on the underlying infrastructure. We categorize them as cloud tolerant application. We then had the Uber state, which was cloud native applications. They are fully API based. Uh, they have stateless interactions of, uh, among their components and are built to recover from any resiliency. So, so these, by, by having these buckets, it helped us to classify what applications are the key targets for migrations. Obviously, the cloud native applications are more geared towards uh, faster adoption on a programmable infrastructure, whereas the cloud tolerant needed additional work. To come up with, uh, to deploy such a cloud native platform, we needed an infrastructure which was programmable and had these characteristics. They needed to support a multi data center deployment. They, used, they need to provide full infrastructure visibility of what, how my workloads are running. What uh, do I, why, if I need to do audibility, how do I do that? Uh, provide auto-scaling features of, for applications that are running on it. Provide integrations for how do I go about uh, putting platform as a service on such an infrastructure platform. And the obvious choice that we came up with was OpenStack because it met most of these key requirements. The architecture, this is the architecture that we came up with for our uh, OpenStack deployment. This, uh, this architecture had, uh, it's a pretty vanilla architecture where we run our management nodes virtualized, our physical compute are running on UCS, B-series uh, hardware. We use Red Hat's OpenStack distribution for our OpenStack uh, deployments. We run our Cinder and Swift on Ceph backend, and they're running off UCS C-series software. Our networking, we run routable networks within our uh, OpenStack, and they use our traditional Nexus fabric. What makes our architecture a little unique is we have consumed these OpenStack APIs through service catalog items on our OpenStack cloud. And uh, that helps us to improve the adoption of OpenStack within our broader Cisco IT. Here's the journey that we took to get to OpenStack where uh, where we started in September of 2013 on Grizzly release, and we did our first full-scale data center deployment on Havana using, uh, using the Havana release. And we will be doing shortly our another data center deployment uh, on Havana in August. 
Uh, we intend to move all our data centers to, on an ACI fabric by end of this year, which will help us give us the flexibility of uh, providing policy-based application deployment and modeling characteristics, which we'll talk more about uh, in, in the future, uh, in the coming slides. So here is, is the example. Let's talk about a case study that we uh, deployed an application on our OpenStack platform that we recently went live with. Uh, this is a so-called a poster child for the modern new generation application uh, that has APIs on the northbound where it can be consumed easily by the web applications and the mobile uh, platform, where also it's able to consume the infra infrastructure by using APIs. Uh, this is a large-scale application uh, that almost consumes multiple racks of our cloud infrastructure. Uh, it had some strict application requirements that needed to scale linearly. Uh, it required zero downtime for across uh, the different components and also had some strict performance requirements in terms of meeting up to 2.5 million page hits uh, per day. Uh, the application has a lot of open source components built with them. Each of them are stateless, and they interact, use, coordinate across them using RabbitMQ bus, pretty typical architecture. And deploying such an application, we learned a lot of key valuable lessons that we're happy to share uh, as part of the process. We learned that there is no magic bullet for application migration. A, a good due diligence that we, if done ahead of the time helps alleviate a lot of pain points. So one of the key things that we quickly understood was if we are able to understand the application architecture and the interaction patterns ahead of the time, that will help us to iterate quickly as we move across the different application lifecycle. Uh, the application was pretty complex. There were too many moving parts. There were uh, interactions which we needed to track. And had we had a documenting process where we were able to tell A component talks to B component in a certain fashion, we would have been able to quickly deploy certain applications as we move from dev to QA to production. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are running traditional networking, and the, there were some strict requirements for our application. It was internet facing, so it comes with own DMZ requirements, it came with uh, its own hardening requirements, and doing that later as an afterthought was uh, pretty painful. The, one of the other challenges we also came was that we, we should have done our, our performance testing of our application as we went along the process. Uh, there were things that happened uh, in an agile fashion, and some of these things uh, were taken as an afterthought. But in a nutshell, we, we came to a conclusion that application deployment is still difficult in OpenStack uh, cloud environments. And the reason being that there are two different paradigms uh, still exist, that deployment uh, developers are still thinking in an application-centric way. They think about, this are our applications, this is how we need to interact across these applications, and infrastructure people are focused on implementation specifics, meaning how is my VLAN working, how, is, how, do, uh, how do I enable these firewall ports. So there is still a, par a distinct parity between when we deploy these applications, and that is something that I'll hand over to Steve to talk about on how we can do better uh, as we move along. Thank you, Dash. So like Dash was saying, we're finding that application deployments are still too difficult in the cloud. And as Dash said, it's because of the difference between the application developers. They're application-centric. They don't understand the infrastructure. It's not their job. The infrastructure engineers understand their infrastructure, but they don't understand the application. And so there's a big disconnect between these two groups. So the question is, is what can we do better? What can we do better next time, and, and, and how can we get there? We need to separate the two concerns. We need to separate the application concerns from the operator concerns, the tenants from the administrators. And with that separation, the application uh, developers can specify how to deploy their application in, with a model, and then the infrastructure engineers can go and deploy via that model. Um, another good thing is, is we want to have dependency mappings. We want to understand when 
service A requires service B so that we can do planning. Uh, the infrastructure operators can operate the infrastructure better. We eliminate surprises when we take down one service and discover that something important depended on it. The other thing we wanted to do is we want to enable network services. We want to be able to chain things like firewalls and load balancers as part of the model rather than specifying them in terms of specific details for the domain like IP addresses and um, uh, round robin uh, 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 characteristics. And so, you know, with this, we looked at group-based policies. The group-based policy is an incubated uh, project within OpenStack. Uh, it is available in the Juno timeframe. It's a 100% open source uh, uh, project within OpenStack. The intent is to cap sorry the intent of the project is to capture the intent of the application and make and model that application so that the infrastructure engineers can deploy it. It's built by a community of developers across the uh, across many companies, including of course Cisco, uh, IBM, and Intel. So what is group-based policy? Well, group-based policy uh, is consumed very similarly to the existing Neutron model, where you have the command line interface, horizon, and heat. But instead of interacting with Neutron directly, they interact with the group-based policy APIs. And then the group-based policy APIs interact with the network either through a Neutron driver using classical Neutron constructs like networks and subnets, or through a native driver, where the native driver interacts with the network directly. The policy model is very interesting. Um, instead of having security groups where you're applying a, a permit and deny rules to an existing group, you have an asymmetric model where you have producers and consumers. With that producer and consumer model, the, uh, the flow of data becomes obvious. The intent becomes obvious. This group depends on this group. And when you add things to one group, you know that the things in the other group will either need to consume or they'll need to produce from that other group. Um, the policy rule set defines the rules and how these two, policy, uh, these two policy groups interact. And those rules can also include chaining. So you know, one group could specify that the access to that group is to be a load balancer or via a firewall. This allows us to do governance so that we can add firewalls and load balancers for InfoSec and for uh, reliability and resiliency reasons. So why do the developers like group-based policy? This one should be fairly evident, right? The intent-based model is very similar to how they see their application. They, they understand the data flows, or at least they should, understand the data flows inside their application from one service to another, and also what services that they need to consume from the outside infrastructure, and, and what they're providing, and the APIs that they're providing. Um, the automation piece here allows operators to deploy an existing application that they already have modeled into multiple data centers, um, either on a disaster recovery basis or just simply for scalability and adding additional capacity. The service chaining, uh, as I got into before, that's a framework for describing the network services and how they interact with the different components of the application. So how do we implement this? We're using a group-based policy driver for OpenStack. That is a APIC driver, which is a native APIC driver. That native APIC driver communicates via, uh, communicates from the group-based policy APIs to the APIC directly to configure the mesh based on the model that's being input. This group-based policy driver is supported in Juno. It has one-to-one -one mapping with ACI constructs to group-based policy constructs. And so when you are adding your group-based policy constructs and, and into the model, you can see those changes reflected in your APIC and in the network. So what is our planned next OpenStack infrastructure? Well, we're looking to go to Juno and Kilo with the group-based policy model, using the group-based policy driver for APIC. This requires us to be on FCS plus 12 ACI release. What that's going to allow is that that's going to allow the OpFlex agent on the hypervisor to make Open vSwitch a fully participating member of the ACI fabric. What that means is, is that means that when you configure APIC, APIC will then configure the Open vSwitch. There's scalability uh, goodness here because you know, Neutron doesn't scale to hundreds and thousands of Open, uh, open vSwitch agents, but with the OpFlex agent it will. And of course, we're using native VXLAN from the server directly into the mesh. And so we're talking the same language as the mesh with NIC offload, so we get the good performance with that. 
So with that, uh, we'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Uh, both Dash and I have been involved with the uh, deployment here and with both with the traditional and the ACI, and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, please use the microphone in the back if you have any. After the deployment, have you changed the support model overall? So before uh, OpenStack and ap after OpenStack deployment for the internal environment? Did, did you hear? The supporting the environment. Uh, I'm sorry, we didn't hear the question. We didn't hear the question. So, so the overall, the internal IT environment, you deployed the OpenStack. So after your deployment, have you changed the support model? A after deploying OpenStack, yeah. have we changed our support model? Yeah. Um, OpenStack is driving a lot of changes in our support model um, with the ability for us to give access to the dashboard to our clients. Um, they are asking for more and more functionality so they can move faster and faster. Um, yes, and I think we, there has been a shift in our, the way we do our operations. Uh, we have started to move towards the whole DevOps model where it is fostering a programmable in infrastructure adoption. Yeah, our, our goal is to get a programmable and uh, elastic infrastructure in both compute, network, and storage. And ACI gives us that in the network side. Yeah, and I think one thing I wanted to play back was when I was talking about the application architecture, there were different components that was a pretty complex application. And the way what will this new architecture with group based policy, the way we'll be able to help is we'll be able to now define like layers. Like, so we'll have like web layer, app layer, and a DB layer. So it doesn't matter how many components you have, we'll be able to deploy them as VMs. And from an application person, he will be able to just say, my web layer wants to talk to my application layer on a particular port. An application wants to talk to a DB on a certain uh, port. So there is like a clear distinction. And as part of that definition, we are able to capture uh, the documentation as a part of the deployment. So when we had to move such a workload from dev to QA, it will be pretty seamless. And uh, with service chaining, we will be no longer having like the firewall challenges that we had, right? So we will be able to dynamically deploy any services in between app to a web layer or web to a DB layer, a classic three-tier application. So that's the benefit that we're aiming with this architecture, uh, with, with the new group based policy. And with ACI, we will get the scale that we need to uh, deploy uh, at such large scales. So. Use the microphone. So, so um, can you talk about when you introduced group-based policy into your phases, you, where you did your first data center, your second data center, and then how much savings did that approach get you in that data center deployment? While group-based policies is available uh, with IP tables, with uh, traditional uh, neutron networking, we, uh, have not used, we have not deployed group-based policy in our OpenStack deployments uh, as of right now, that is our our plan to do. Uh, plan to uh, to do. We are looking to do that by the end of the year. Yes, and we have we have worked and seen if that architecture worked for us in our our uh, labs, uh, specifically how the group based policy interacts with uh, a tenant network, not necessarily a provider network, and how that architecture works. So that's uh, we have a design ready, and that's planned for as a next step for us. In terms of cost savings, I think. The savings would be more around operation cost savings, because, uh, but, but that's yet to be realized, so we really can't comment there. So. Uh, just to be clear, group-based policies was only released uh, last year? Last year, yeah. I think it, last year late, I think. November yes. time frame, right? Yes. And with that, you know, we're one of the first adopters to really try to push that out into our uh, development, staging, and production data centers. Yep, yeah, and we've been working closely with the community to kind of uh, make, yes. That, yes. Uh, make that deployment successful. Yeah, go ahead. What, what sort of upgrade strategy do you have in mind to go from Havana to Juneau? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were in an earlier uh, session with, uh, with uh, uh, Todd uh, where we were talking about how to upgrade from Havana to Juneau. Uh, that's still a, a matter of some great debate amongst the uh, operations and design staff. <laughs> It's still under discussion. I think the short answer is we're, we're probably taking the um, well-documented road, but with the more conservative approach where we'll 
go through the hops in. So what, what is the, well, I'm, I'm curious about the upgrade path and I'm, I'm curious about the upgrade path in general because I haven't heard a lot of discussions about that. So is it? Um, the document, the, the, the safe way is to obviously move up one level at a time, Havana to Ice House, Ice House to Juno. Okay. And because Ice House exists in both 6.5 and 7.0 rel, we, use, we obviously use open, uh, OpenStack from Red Hat. Um, you can use Ice House to bridge from 6.5 to 7.0. Yeah, so we brainstormed different options, and I think we settled on going one hop at a time to minimize uh, impact to our service. So uh, on existing hardware, though. So on no, existing mm -hmm. hardware, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Now, the ACI deployment, because the model is so different um, from the security group model, and because the intent of applications isn't captured in the security group model, that the existing applications will need to get some um, overview and working with the application owners to, to build those models. So when we move to ACI, we'll be building that greenfield, uh, either Juno or Kila. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the uh, title of the presentation was Migrating Virtualized Applications to OpenStack. So uh, I'm assuming that means uh, migrating VMware virtualized applications to OpenStack. That's question one. And then within that context, is everything you said apply to any app that's virtualized under VMware? Or which type of apps under VMware do you recommend moving to OpenStack and which you don't? Do you want to take that one? Yeah. So Yes, the title was around migrating application. And this is the step. We wanted to give a pre-talk around uh, how we move, what are, what are the things we are doing in place as a prereq for making that happen. So the goal that we have is once we have group-based policy implemented, applications which are more uh, cloud-ready or cloud-native, the two and the three in our hierarchy, become a good fit because they have API-based and they have agility uh, for cloud. Uh, and they can move regardless of whether they are VMware virtualized or uh, or any other virtualization, and then they, they can be a good fit because you can now bundle them together, and as long as you know the interaction patterns across them, you can able to uh, define a contract across them, and, and hence it simplifies the architecture. But we are, we're not there yet in terms of uh, implementing in our production data center, but that's, that's the journey that we're going. So we will be happy to come back and talk about how we did this. And, and, we, and we plan to submit a talk about what our, um, outcomes have been of going down this, uh, this road and modeling applications and working with the application owners. Um, the, the bullet item that I, I give people for the 15 second elevator talk is there's no magic bullet, right? Migration into OpenStack requires knowledge of the applications, requires you to classify the application as cloud native, cloud tolerant, or cloud ready, and take the appropriate steps at that point to migrate that application or decide not to. You know, the monolithic applications that require infrastructure um, uh, resiliency that don't have application resiliency are not good fits for OpenStack. Or will require substantial effort, so yeah. Yes, yes. So you're not recommending, you know, any app that's virtualized be using your steps to move to OpenStack? Uh, if an application requires, has a single point of failure that requires high availability at this point, we do not recommend to the application owner to move that into OpenStack. OpenStack does, does not have a pets mentality. It's cattle, not pets. Now, in the community, we see that kind of changing. There's, there's part of the community that wants to see more HA features. Um, I believe that there are a number of vendors that are talking about providing those features. When that happens, then we would change our uh, guidance along those lines about saying, for those applications that require these kind of HA uh, feature sets, uh, we will support you in this manner. But at this yeah, point, we yeah. would say And no. just to put a finer point on that one, right? So I think there is a merit on why people want to ma uh, migrate to OpenStack. I think it's not just like, yes, I want to get away from licensing and I want to just put on OpenStack, right? So what our philosophy has been within our enterprise is migrate those applications that can truly get the benefits of a programmable infrastructure. That, so hence, I think in our view, uh, 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 there has to be a median where you have cloud-ready and cloud-native applications which are more intelligent and they're able to use a flexible programmable infrastructure to migrate there because, yes, a lift and shift can happen, but, but what, what's the value there? So that's, that's, that's something that we are promoting within our enterprise. Yeah, you talk about programmable infrastructure, but mm -hmm. doesn't VMware and vCenter, they also have APIs to instantiate? I mean, isn't the, some of that already there? The APIs available for, for VMware um, are not 
Well, first of all, they're not restful. Um, the orchestration team, of, of which a number of members are, are here, can attest to some of the difficulties with orchestrating against VMware. Against OpenStack, it's a restful call, which is you know very easy to do. You can do those with, you can do those on the command line. And in fact, for testing, we do that all the time. And so you know, you say that there's an application programming interface to VMware, and I'm sure that from by some definition there is. But I would say that the OpenStack APIs are much easier, much more well thought out, and provide much more feedback in terms of you know success or failure. So uh, my question actually is that, um, do you have any customer who, who was hosting applications built by non, like proprietary um, programming technologies such as like Microsoft hosted on Hyper-V? Did you have such a customer and, um, and how did you manage to um, convince them to migrate over into OpenStack? Okay, so we are primarily, at Cisco IT, we're primarily an ESX shop. So ESX and bare metal. And so there's no, there's no appreciable Hyper-V infrastructure for us. And so we don't have very much experience with dealing with Hyper-V Hyper -V, yeah. and, and that technology. I, sorry. <laughs> not, not our thing. Very simple question. Mm -hmm. Where can I get the slides? Um, I, I will provide the slides either through um, the conference or if not, give me your card and I'll email them. Yeah, we can email you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Other questions? All right, thank you very much.